Today is September 14, 2016. I am interviewing Dr. Sunny Ramaswamy, who is the director of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Institute of Food and Agriculture, or NIFA. I am Susan Fugate, head of special collections at the USDA's National Agricultural Library. This month, I will celebrate 40 years with USDA. We are in USDA's creative media and broadcast studio in Washington, D.C. As I said, today I'm interviewing Dr. Sunny Ramaswamy. He was appointed to serve as director of the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture on May 7, 2012. NIFA's mission, very basically, is to invest in an advanced agricultural research, education, and extension. Prior to joining NIFA, Dr. Ramaswamy served in several academic positions. So to begin, if you would share with us some biographical information and go as early as you'd like in your life. Okay. Yeah, so thanks so much, Susan, for having me here uh, this uh, afternoon and appreciate the work that you folks are doing in the National Agricultural Library. Thanks. And it's a, a tremendously important repository of knowledge for all of us, for our nation, for that matter, for the world. So I appreciate you taking the time to do this as well. So in, in regards to my own background, uh, as you probably can tell, I was born and raised in India. And uh, had the I, I was born into a, a single pan well, I was born in India, in southern India, in Bangalore. And uh, I was raised by a single parent, by my mother. My dad died when I was a 10-year-old. And so my mother, uh, my dad was a you know, high school graduate, and my mom had had an eighth grade education, and my dad died when I was you know, 10 years old. He died saving another man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my mom, with her eighth grade education, had to raise us, and she held multiple jobs, and we're you know, pretty poor. Uh, but she insisted that education was very important, so she ended up sending us to Jesuit schools. And we got a tremendous education at, the, at uh, the, the school that we went to, my brothers and I. We're four brothers, by the way. And, uh, uh, and I think that education was critically important. And it was a time in, Indi in India in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, but my dad died in 62, when India really could not feed itself. And uh, so America had a very strong and important influence on India itself and its ability to feed itself. And uh, uh, America was involved in not only giving food aid, but also because the food minister, that would be like the Secretary of Agriculture, had uh, met with John Foster Dulles and, and asked Dulles, as the Secretary of State at that time in the 1950s, to help, for America to help India to become self-sufficient in, in its uh, food needs. And allegedly, the food minister used the biblical passage of, uh, you know, uh, giving a man food, ver a fish versus teaching him how to fish. And Dulles uh, was inspired by it. Dulles himself uh, is, uh, uh, was religious, and he was inspired by it. And he contacted, he asked, he called upon the American Land Grant Universities, uh, like Michigan State University, Kansas State University, and others across America, to go to India to help build these land grant colleges in India. They were built, and I got an education at one of those institutions. The second thing that happened was talking about food aid itself. India got a lot of food aid, and being you know, a relatively poor family and in India at that time, you had to have a ration card to get rations, monthly rations, of X number of pounds of rice and wheat and sugar and things like that. And occasionally, America would send uh, care packages, in quotes, of, uh, you know, additional wheat or flour or sugar or uh, powdered milk or whatever. And my grandmother, somehow, she used to live with us, somehow would, you know, hear about the fact that America was sending this powdered milk, and she'd tell me to go stand in line as a 10, 11-year-old to stand in line to get this additional amount of whatever it was. And when we got the sugar and the powdered milk and things like that, she'd make all these desserts for us as well. But the, what really struck me at that time, and I still remember it, it's seared in my brain, is these burlap sacks with the handshake and the stars and stripes shield on it. And it's, it's you know, seared in my brain. So America fed me, and I got educated at those land-grant colleges. By the way, the institution that I went to in Bangalore was adopted by and, and, and really helped establish uh, by the University of Tennessee. 
and I got my education there. The third thing that happened that's also had a huge influence on me and who I am now is that one Norman Borlaug, uh, you know, some of your, so you, I'm sure, know of Norman Borlaug, uh, who is uh, considered to be the father of the Green Revolution and considered to have fed a billion people, including yours truly. He had figured out how to dwarf wheat, which has been the bane of farming. As you know, gr crops grow really tall, they're heavy with grain, and you get the wind blowing and they lodge. And uh, so he figured that out. That knowledge was transferred into Indian varieties, uh, into wheat and rice, and like they say, the rest is history. And I got to meet him personally when he came to Bangalore to the institution that I went to, the University of Agricultural Sciences. And I thought he's just another one of these old white guys running around. There's a whole bunch of old white guys running around in India at that time. And didn't know who he was. And, and then lo and behold, the following year in 1971, he got the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, I read about it in the paper. And, and so those three influences have been tremendous in my own you know, development, in my own thinking, how I deploy my thinking to what I do. So I went on to get my undergraduate degree. Uh, in agriculture uh, and in Bangalore, and I got my master's degree uh, in entomology. And then I had the privilege of uh, having a, an American professor from Rutgers come on a sabbatical to India, and I worked with him, and he offered me an opportunity to come to America, and I came to the States in 1976 and uh, got my PhD, and I worked on uh, cockroaches, on the sexual behavior of cockroaches, and in fact, I'm one of the world's experts on the sexual behavior of insects. And uh, so I thought, you know, I'd end up going back to India or get into the international development uh, arena or some such thing. But I got talked into staying put. And I, uh, you know, went on from Rutgers after my PhD to get a postdoc in Michigan at Michigan State University. Then I went to talked into moving to Mississippi State University as a professor, where I developed my, you know, academic uh, career over the next 15 years. I got, you know, promoted and tenured, became a full professor. Again, I continued to work on the sexual behavior and the signals between insects, uh, males and females, uh, of, you know, various pests, particularly the ones that are pests of uh, cotton and corn and, and other crops important to the United States, particularly the southern United States. Uh, and then I got talked into, uh, throwing my hat in the ring and, and being uh, you know, given, offered the position to become the head of the entomology department at uh, Kansas State University. And uh, I was there for several years. Then I got talked into moving to Purdue, another great land-grant university, to manage their agricultural research programs. And I was having a, a tremendous time there. And I, you know, headhunter contacted me and talked me into moving to Oregon State University, where I was the dean of the college. And uh, again, along the way, I kept my research going. I love to teach and did extension work as well. And in Oregon, I was actually, you know, deans in America have to raise a lot of money and uh, for scholarships and things like that. I'm sure, you know, your alma mater has contacted you, Susan, as well, to give money. And uh, so I'm one of those deans that used to do that. I'm pretty good at asking for and getting money. And I was driving uh, up from uh, Corvallis, Oregon, to Portland, Oregon, to the airport to fly out to the Midwest, to go around the Midwest to ask for money. And the phone on my iPhone rings, and it's on my spe uh, car speaker. And I say, hello, this is uh, Sonny. And female voice on the other end says, is this Dr. Ramaswamy? And I was a little leery, because people know me, call me Sonny. Nobody calls me Ramaswamy. And uh, so I thought, I'm somebody that I don't know. And I was a little leery, the voice I didn't recognize. And then it's a female voice, introduces herself, and, uh, and then introduces this other person, uh, which is Kathy Watecki. And uh, so then they say, do you have some time now? I said, yeah, I do. And, uh, and they said they're from the White House. And I look at my uh, Brian Todd, uh, pardon me, uh, Todd Bastian, who worked with me in my fundraising efforts and things like that. And I looked at him, I said, I mouthed, you got to be kidding me. And uh, so, and then this, you know, they said, are you sitting down? Uh, so do you have some time? I said, yeah, I'm driving. Then they said, are you sitting down? I said, and I chuckled and I said, in a matter of speaking, I'm sitting down. And they chuckled as well. 
And then they said that the president would like to appoint you to this position. And, you know, my knees started shaking, and uh, I said, you know, I'm going to have to pull over now. And, and I did. And uh, so, like they say, the rest is history. And uh, so I was appointed, you know, for a poor kid growing up in India to be asked by the president of the United States, anybody in America, if the president calls you in quotes, you say, yes, sir, sign me up. And uh, for a young person growing up in India and the circumstances that I did, uh, that America had had this incredible impact on me, uh, the American taxpayer, and here was the opportunity for me to work to, you know, in quotes, uh, give back and, and, or give forward, as it were. And it was a no-brainer for me to, to say yes. Of course, I called my wife and daughter and my son-in-law, and we were all excited. And, and it took many, many months to go through the vetting process, uh, in part because I was born and raised in a different country and lived in many parts of America as well. So, you know, here I am. It's been about uh, four and a half years since I came on board. And uh, only in America something like this could happen. Well, it's a wonderful story. And I do have in my notes that I was going to be sure that we at least got to hear that story, which is a real life changer for you. Uh-huh, indeed. <clears throat> um, one of the things you're well known for is how you speak passionately about the need for better communication in science. Can you talk about communication in science and your approach for improving understanding between scientists and the public and also between scientists. Yeah, I think this whole idea about communication, you know, we all focus on, oh my gosh, we need all these, uh, you know, gizmos and doodads and these discoveries that we make, need to make, these inventions that we need to make and things like that. Yeah, certainly we need to do all of that. But all those inventions and discoveries and gizmos and doodads and GMOs and everything else means nothing at all if we don't bring the public along as well. And we've been remiss in not engaging with the public. Not, in, you know, not only not engaging with the public, and also when we do engage with the public, we come across with a condescending style. That is, here I am the expert, I'm a PhD, what do you know? John Q. Public, and listen to me, I'm going to tell you how this is all about, to, you know, supposed to work and things like that. So there's a sort of a condescension, a patronizing a, a approach that we've used, and for the most part, we've not communicated as scientists, for the most part. And, you know, look at the conversations we're having in this country, whether it's about climate change or about uh, genetically modified uh, crops or about uh, whatever the topic du jour about water, about obesity, about organics, about sustainable food systems or whatever it is. And, and I think we have to necessarily take the time to engage with the public. And, and the word communication itself to me implies a, a one way, you know, I'm the expert, I'm gonna tell you what to do. And that's why I like to use the word engagement. I want to engage with you, with the public, and find out what it is that, that we should be doing. And I think, you know, the, the hallmark of extension, cooperative extension service that we know, which NIFA uh, supports, which is undertaken by the land-grant universities across America, is it's a participatory approach. That is, I am going to come and find out, first of all, what it is that you need. I'm going to undertake that effort and then make the discoveries and all that, translate it, and then provide that back to you, and then iteratively get to a better spot. And in fact, if you look at our tagline for the National Institute of Food and Agriculture that we crafted here in the last few years, is user-informed science that transforms lives. It is at the day, at the end of the day, it is about transforming lives. But the transforming of those lives needs to happen with knowledge from those lives as to what it is that we ought to be undertaking as well. And so to tell the story, to engage, to demonstrate the, the, the creativity, the excitement that goes into this, this incredible enterprise of food and agriculture. I mean, food is truly essential for our very existence as humanity. It's fundamental to us. And, and the weird thing is that, uh, you know, people, uh, they don't want technology in the food because it's very, very personal. They want technology in this. They want the latest, greatest, uh, you know, smartphones and things like that, but not in their food. They don't want you to be 
messing around with their food. But the technologies that we've got in our food are really the technologies that humans have incorporated into our food systems ever since we started eating as humanity, ever since we invented agriculture. What these new technologies allow us to do, these new techniques allow us to do, is to hasten that process. Rather than taking 10, 15, 20 years to develop new varieties, to develop new breeds of animals and things like that, it hastens the process. Today we can do it in six months. Okay? But we got to engage with the public to demonstrate why it is that we do this, how do we do it, show them, be, become totally transparent as well. And, and we have failed to do it. The weird thing is, the same individual that does not want technology in their food but wants the latest, greatest iPhone, also want technology if they have cancer or some disease of that nature. In fact, much of the latest drugs we use are what we refer to as biologics. These are derived from genetically modified cells and organisms. The insulin people take for diabetes is a result of genetic modification. Okay? The drugs we use today, these modern drugs that cost $10,000, dollars $20,000 uh, per treatment that we've all heard about on, on television and on the news and things like that, uh, those drugs are also derived through biotechnology. Okay? So people want technology for something that's going to affect them, i.e. their health. They want technology for the, the, the gizmos they want to use, like televisions and smartphones and all that, but they don't want technology in their food. But we've always used technology. Humanity has done that, figuring out how to deal with droughts, figuring out how to deal with the lack of water, you know, on and on and on, incorporating the traits that we need, you know, the taste that we need. It's all been done by selection. It is technology. It is knowledge being applied. And biotechnology is really the application of knowledge. And so in engaging with the public, in, in helping them understand why these things are done, how we do it, in an open and transparent manner, and not just throw data at them, you know, and, and avoid coming across as condescending and, and patronizing, would go a long ways. And, and so we have to collectively do a better job of helping our, our staff, our colleagues, develop the ability to engage with the media and the public. And so we, uh, you know, uh, in my former life and now in NIFA, we're bringing in experts to help my staff, my scientific staff, know how to engage with the public. Because we are a public-facing organization and we need to know how to do that as scientists and as, as you know, people that are here to support the development of knowledge that will allow us to address these, this existential threat that we've got of nutritional security. Can you talk now, um, a little change of gears, about your philosophy and approach to leadership, particularly in the public sector? Yeah, you know, <laughs> leadership, again, uh, you know, there's the, the old uh, uh, adage about uh, uh, the definition of pornography. Leadership is just like that. You know it when you see it. And it's, it's a, to use a French term, it's a sort of a je ne sais quoi. And you can't really nail it down. You can use all these different characteristics to describe what leadership is all about. And what I like to say is, you know, we got to help, again, just like in the communications world, we've got to help inculcate leadership as well. Back in the good old days, we're talking about 150 four years ago, back in 1862, when the U.S. Department of Agriculture was established, and the Morrill Act was passed that created the land-grant universities. The Morrill Act said three things need to happen. One is foundational knowledge and math and science and humanities and reading and writing and things like that, that everybody must have. Secondly, and built on top of it, is practical knowledge in the agricultural and mechanic arts. And then, last but not least, is military leadership. Not so much learning how to shoot guns as much as inculcating leadership skills. That is the, the communication skills, the uh, problem solving skills, the uh, critical thinking skills, working in a team environment, working in, uh, you know, taking 
knowledge gained here and applying it in a different context and things of that nature. That's what leadership is all about. And today, we refer to this as the non-cognitive skills. Uh, and in fact, there's a body of literature about this as well. We had that. That was a requirement in the education that we offered in these land-grant universities. But over the years, we, we eliminated it, along with a whole bunch of other things because of budget cuts and things like that. And now we've come full circle to where we're you know, resurrecting the uh, inculcation of uh, leadership skills as well. So my own leadership style is... Uh, uh, you know, very much of a, uh, you know, incorporating the cognitive skills and the, uh, pardon me, the non-cognitive skills, along with the cognitive skills, the, the technical knowledge that I've got as well. But really, it is this non-cognitive skills, the people skills that we talk about. My style is, I, you know, my role is to be a facilitator and enabler of great things that others need to be doing. And I'm not the kind of person that uh, goes down and you know, says, you will do thus and such. My style is one of uh, helping people look for outcomes. I'm very outcomes driven. I'm in your face. And I'm willing to uh, question my own assumptions and others' assumptions. I never ask anybody to do anything that I don't myself do. So I you know, model myself as well in, in the style that I have. And uh, uh, so those are the, the approaches that I end up doing in my own in leadership as well. And then, you know, you live vicariously through the efforts of others as a leader. And so you don't do these things because, you know, you're going to gain a halo around your head or, you know, some sort of a, a recognition or whatever. You live, again, uh, th through the efforts of the others that are undertaking this incredible enterprise that they're involved in as well, helping them get to a better spot. And, and that's what, to me, is all leadership all about. And, and going back to this education and training that we used to offer as a result of the Morrill Act itself, that inculcation is critically important. Again, uh, for a long period of time, we had you know, given up on it. And now in our grants that we offer, by the way, we have, if you've got uh, students that are going to be educated as part of the grants that we provide you, those young people must get, one, the technical knowledge, the cognitive skills, but you have to demonstrably show us that you're going to also inculcate these non-cognitive leadership skills as well. Measurable non-cognitive cognitive leadership skills as well. So what we want to do is to resurrect what America is all about. Is It is about leadership. I mean, you know, if you look at our global preeminence, that's what it's about. It's not that we're damn good technicians. You know, the Chinese can do all of these things better than anybody can, or the Indians, or whomever. But what keeps America ahead of the game is the, the ability to question yourself, the ability to question authority, the ability to, you know, go and, and uh, apply the knowledge and, and the, uh, the, the critical thinking and problem solving skills and things of that nature. Great. Um, can you talk about some of the major accomplishments in, um, during your tenure as head of NIFA? Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of weird to say that there's some major accomplishments during my tenure. Science is built on the efforts of others from way back when. So you can't really say that there was a sort of a start and stop. But something started on May 7th, 2012, the day I got sworn in by Secretary Vilsack. And then, you know, some great things have happened. So the great things that have happened uh, are, is the result of many, many years of investments by NIFA and its predecessors. As you, as you know, uh, personally as well, you know, NIFA came from the Cooperative State Research Extension and Education Service, CSREES, which came from uh, CSRS, Cooperative State Research Service, and Extension Service, which were merged back in the mid-1990s, and prior to that. So we go back, my agency goes back to the very inception of USDA and the creation of the land-grant colleges at that time by, you know, uh, the passage of the Morrill Act and, the, and that being signed into law by Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln. And so there's been an agency throughout that period of time for 152, uh, 154 years uh, that has been around to protect uh, the, the interests of the federal government. And so I'll give you a, a couple of examples, having said that, knowing full well it's built on this body of knowledge that comes along for us. Uh, you know, a project that we have funded uh, that's led by the University of California, Davis, and the University of Minnesota, multiple universities involved in it, 
And it's called the TCAP project. It's called the Tritice, T-R-I-T-A, T-R-I-T-I-C-E-A-E, Tritice CAP, Coordinated Agricultural Project. The work that's been done by that team of individuals has resulted now, this year if you look at, about 20% of the wheat acreage in America includes varieties of wheat developed by that particular project. That constitutes about $3.5 billion that's added to the pocketbooks of our farmers. That's one example. A second example of work that's being done, you know, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, you know, Chipotle, the uh, casual fast food restaurant having the problems with uh, food safety issues and the cruise ship disease, you know, people going on cruise ships, they end up getting, uh, uh, you know, tummy problems and diarrhea and, and vomiting and things like that. That, one of the, cr cr the bugs that causes that is referred to as norovirus. And so we provided funding again to a team led by uh, uh, North Carolina State University. Uh, and again, there's a whole bunch of partners in it across America uh, have figured out how to mitigate the impact of norovirus. It's a truly a transformative uh, uh, discoveries that are being made that are now will allow us to say, okay, norovirus, you're done. It's over. We're not going to have to worry about it. Okay. Give you a third example. Uh, nor so we support the efforts at multiple institutions across America, not just academics, but predominantly academics. Land grants are a predominant part of it, but non-land grants as well. But within the land grant community, we have multiple institutions that we support. We refer to them as 1862s. That would be the Purdue's, the Michigan States, and others. They were established back in 1862. Then what we refer to as 1890s. These are the historically black institutions in America. This would be like Fort Valley State University, Kentucky State University, North Carolina A&T University, et cetera. And there's 19 of those institutions. And then we have the 1994s. These are tribal colleges and universities. And we have 36 of those. And then we have a brand new avatar created in 2012. These are the Hispanic serving agricultural colleges and universities. There's about 120 odd of those. So, there are four such institutions that we provide funding to. Now, going back to an example, North Carolina Anti University has done some pretty cool work that I'm really, really excited about. So, as you know, in America, I'm sure you've heard about this uh, peanut allergies. We have about 2% of America's population that has peanut allergies. In fact, if you remember, uh, airline companies got rid of peanuts, the one thing that they used to give us along with food back in the old days. They got rid of their peanuts and in fact we got labels on our foods now that says beware this was produced in a facility where nuts have been processed or whatever because we have to be very mindful of children having anaphylactic shock and potentially dying because of the allergies they have to peanuts and other nuts as well. So uh, the, the scientists at North Carolina A&T University, a historically black institution, figured out a very simple food enzyme. So it's a natural food enzyme that's found in the food that you and I consume. And they treat the peanuts with that for about, they wash it in there for a few minutes. And it, it eliminates, that washing eliminates well over 98% of the allergens that are in that peanut. Now imagine this very healthy, full of protein and full of really good oils can be consumed even by people that have uh, peanut allergies as well. So those, you know, give you a sense of the kind of uh, uh, really cool transformative discoveries. I really like to think, uh, going back to user-inspired science that transforms lives. It is about transforming lives. So I can go on and on about uh, all manner of discoveries and, and uh, other things as well, but I'm going to stop right there. They're excellent examples, I think, that touch the lives of many, as you say. Now I'd like you to talk about a challenge that you have faced as director of NIFA and talk a little bit about how you resolved it. Yeah. Uh, you know, my... Or opportunity. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, you know, my, uh, my style, my approach to life, again, I think in part, I like to say that we're the sum total of all of our experiences until this moment. Everything that we've had, that we've been exposed to, and it's the genetics, it's the nurturing, it's the experiences that we've had. What you see today is that sum total of it. 
And so because of my upbringing in a single parent family, being the youngest kid, being beaten up by my brothers, having to, in quotes, fend for myself, you know, studying in a Jesuit school, and you know, all of these experiences have allowed me to develop a pretty thick skin and to be able to take on, I'm very much in your face, I deal with it head on. With me, you get it like it is. I'm very candid, say it like it is, whether it's uh, the undersecretary or the secretary or the custodial person. I'll say it like it is. I, I absolutely do not mince words. And uh, um, so, you know, I, actually, the challenges have not been, you know, challenges, oh my gosh, you know, this challenge or that challenge. It's been, uh, working with uh, Congress, for example, to get more resources, or uh, engaging with our stakeholder community that would, you know, come to me and, and complain about a particular issue or whatever it is, or some land grant university, or somebody didn't get their grant or whatever. Those are the things that I've had, uh, you know, to deal with, and I take it head on, and I understand what the issue is. I convene a group of individuals to figure out, I'm, again, very outcomes driven, as I said in my you know, leadership style as well. What's the outcome we want to achieve? And there's got to be a path to get there, right? Whatever that challenge is that, that I've been exposed, subject to two here in the last four plus years, is think of an outcome. There's got to be a way to get to that outcome. We all agree, or we all agreed that this is the outcome that we want to get to. There may be challenges in how you're going to get there. There may be opportunities on how you get there, but you can figure out a path forward as well. So luckily, I've not had you know very serious issues or challenges. Uh, I think for me, the biggest challenge has been how slow get, uh, things get done in the federal government. I'm by nature very impatient, and uh, I have to you know bite my tongue and kind of wait for things to happen. I've, the, the, my favorite, well, when I first came on board, my favorite word to use was obfuscation. And uh, people would say, well, this is the way we've done it. Or, you know, keep saying something so you go away from here. And I would not allow that to happen. Absolutely, positively not. And, and so in my own personal dictionary, going back to my leadership style again, I've gotten rid of the word fail and no. I never say no. And I've gotten rid of the word fail because we just didn't try hard enough to figure out a path forward as well. And so that's the way I, uh, I approach uh, these things. And yeah, there's challenges, I and mean, challenges are all, you know, depending on your one's perspective, right? It's like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. And uh, what, a what's a, what is a challenge to me may not be to you or to somebody else, right? And uh, so if you approach it from that perspective, and approach it from the perspective that there's always a path forward that you can figure out, and uh, because you didn't try hard enough or didn't come up with a creative way of uh, addressing that particular challenge, you take care of it. So going back to this whole obfuscation and the slow pace, and people in my, uh, in my agency know I say this all the time, it only takes about four years to get things done in the federal government. We've made a lot of changes in the agency. We're uh, very much data-driven, and we track everything that we do. Decisions that we make are based on evidence, not some somebody said so approach. And uh, uh, we've embarked on grants modernization, for example. We've incorporated Lean Six Sigma continuous process improvement. We've got black belt that we've hired. We're training our staff to become black belts ultimately. We've got a whole bunch of green belts in, in Six Sigma. And again, it's about processes. It's about who we're doing all this for. It's the taxpayers. And it's the outcomes that we want to achieve as well. So when you approach these things from that perspective, you know, really, it's not a challenge per se. Yeah, so some of these things might take a little bit longer because we also had to reduce our footprint because of the budget cuts we had when I first came on board. I eliminated 35 positions is what I did. And, uh, I mean, you know, so, you know, your plate's already full. You got more stuff on that plate now as a, as a staff member within the agency. We cut back on travel and things like that too. Again, with the idea that, you know, we have to do these things before we get, can get to a better spot. And so we're at a tremendously better spot now. Good. That's good to know. Um, I know that your career and your public service has touched many more of the fields of agriculture than entomology, but can you talk about entomology and its present state and future potential? Yeah. So, you know, if you think of nutritional security, food, Right? Food as a construct, 
uh, required for our very existence, for our very survival, aside from the fact that it's also good to eat and you know, be part of the cultural you know, aspects of who we are as humans, it's necessary for our very survival. When you look at it from that perspective, and when you look at farmers and livestock producers that produce that food, and the constraints they're facing. These constraints I like to think of, so they're sitting in the middle providing that food to us. And there's a whole bunch of constraints around them. These constraints can be broken down into what I refer to as abiotic, non-living constraints. That includes everything from climate change to diminishing land and water resources to environmental degradation to regulations to policies to labor to immigration. All of these are the non-living things. Okay? Those are constraints, and I can go on and on about it for many hours. And then we've got biological constraints, biotic constraints. These include everything from insects and weeds and pathogens to genetics and genomics and all the other things that are all living things. Okay? So those are the constraints. And so in that construct of constraints, then, insects are a very significant constraint and, oh, by the way, uh, also uh, beneficial to our ability to get food on the table that our livestock producers and our farmers are working really hard to make sure that you and I can partake of it. And so with that being the case, as long as humanity is around, as long as we need to eat food, there's going to be these constraints. And insects are going to be an important part of it. Okay. There's Two million species that have been of insects that have been described, that is, given a name, a specific name, a scientific name, you know, the binomial nomenclature that we call. Uh, like the German cockroach that I worked on in understanding its sexual behavior, it's called Botella germanica, a small cockroach from Germany, that's what it means. And uh, so there are two million such species, and there are estimates that there are probably another about 20 to 30, 10 to 15 fold more that we have no clue about. And uh, that we need to continue to understand what these things are. In just thinking of humanity's super specialization of the food that we consume, you know, by trial and error over the millennia, as humanity, you know, became upright and uh, in Africa and then spread out of Africa and we started inventing agriculture and things like that. By trial and error, we figured out there are 50,000 species of plants you and I can consume. Actually, not just survive, but thrive on. But what's happened is because of globalization and travel and movement and migrations of peoples, we've narrowed it down to about a dozen species that we all consume. Of those, there's the big five. The big five are wheat, rice, corn, potatoes, and uh, uh, bananas, plantains, okay? The production of these things, you know, we talk about climate change. Climate change is not only having a direct impact, just this morning in the Washington Post, today is September the 14th, 2016. Uh, this morning's Washington Post had an article about work that we supported, by the way, to these folks at the University of Florida and other places around the world that have shown that a one degree increase, centigrade increase in temperature, which has already happened, by the way, if you compare where we are today, compare, you know, back uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, is going to have a negative impact of about 4 to 6 percent reduction in yield in wheat. Okay? So that's the biological constraints. That is climate change, direct impacts, increasing temperatures. And then you got droughts. Then you got extreme weather events and all those other things as well. Oh, by the way, we got new insects coming in, new pathogens coming in. There's a pathogen called UG98, UG99, pardon me, from Uganda. It's like one of the most devastating potential pathogens that we've got. And, you know, scientists at Land Grant Universities and the Agricultural Research Service are working really hard to figure out how to defeat that thing, new varieties of wheat and things like that that they are developing as well. Insects that are coming in. You know, we got saw flies, we got hessian fly, we got, you name it, Russian wheat aphid came in. 
And uh, these things are all coming in constantly. There's like constantly, you know, new things that are coming in that we have to be mindful of. In fact, I'll give you an example of something that's really, truly transformative that we've supported. In Kentucky, uh, back in the spring, late spring, they discovered a field with one little field of a few plants with wheat blast that was genetically the same thing as the one in Bolivia in South America. Now, how in the heck did it jump over here? So they called one of the world's experts on this, Barbara Valent from Kansas State University. She flew to Kentucky, saw it, determined what it was, and APHIS got involved in the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, USDA agency got involved in it. They got a confirmation from Rockville, Maryland, uh, DNA analysis. They destroyed it. So we didn't see it anymore across America. And then, two weeks later, there was a case in Bangladesh. And so she flew to Bangladesh at the uh, request of U.S. Agency for International Development. Same situation. So is that because people are traveling? Is that because an insect carried it? Is that because a bird carried it? Maybe it was a, a you know, uh, waterfowl that are heading north from South America to go to Alaska, which as you know, when you have seedlings, uh, waterfowl will land and eat those seedlings. Okay, maybe they pooped. They're carrying that particular pathogen and they pooped, they landed here and they pooped over there only in that one spot. We don't know, we don't know what the source of it is. Uh, or, God forbid, introduced inter intentionally. And that's a possibility as well. And so these are the sorts of things that from an entomological perspective, from a, a plant pathology perspective, from a weed science perspective, these biological constraints that we've got. We need to be very, very mindful that, again, going back to the statement I made, as long as humanity's around, we're gonna have these constraints. And we have to make the investments necessary to be able to protect humanity's interests, which is nutritional security. Is there a program or project or experience that comes to mind, particularly um, while you've been at NIFA, that has taught you something you just did not expect? Oh, <laughs> the, the, uh, I mean, you know, just the federal government itself, the, the ways of the federal government, that was like an aha moment for me, you know. I've always lived in academia. It's like I never left college, and I stayed put, and uh, went on for the next, uh, I mean, I got into college back in uh, India in uh, 1967, 68, and uh, until 2012, I've been in quotes in college, and, you know, academia is a particularly unique animal, particularly American academia. And the government is even more unique, I think. And that was a, an aha moment for me. But really, you know, more, more seriously, I think, to me, what's the most fantastic thing and that I get to live every day vicariously in is the ingenuity that's brought to bear on addressing these compelling challenges that we've got. It's mind-boggling to think of that there are people here in America and around the world that are so incredibly, incredibly curious and you know, intelligent and can apply that intelligence, that critical thinking skills and problem-solving skills to, to deal with whatever. I mean, you know, talking about this, this uh, blast that came in, you know, out of the blue it shows up. And you've got to call upon all of your experiences to be able to decipher what it is. Because we're talking about the livelihoods of literally hundreds of thousands of wheat farmers in America. And our food, yours and my food, our bread, our, you know, whatever we're gonna be consuming wheat in. And, and so, so really to me is that ingenuity, it's the application of that ingenuity. And what we do, Really, again, going back to the, the tagline that we've got about transforming lives, it's user-informed science that's transforming lives, is not science for the sake of science. It's not science that you know, goes on a bookshelf and then forgotten. It's really about science. And so it's the ingenuity that's being applied 
to address the societal challenges that we've got. So that's, that's like, oh my, that, that, it jazzes me, it stokes me. Good. And I will um, draw this interview to a conclusion, offering you an opportunity to share any additional stories, thoughts, predictions. <laughs> I'm going to predict uh, what's going to happen in uh, uh, the first Tuesday of November as well. <laughs> well, you know, really, I appreciate the, the opportunity to uh, share some thoughts with you and, you know, this archive that uh, y'all are putting together at the National Ag Library. I think it's, it's fantastic. I've done this previously as well, as I said to you earlier. And, and thanks very much for, uh, you know, including me in this as well. It's been an amazing ride for me. And, you know, I stay on beyond this administration. Uh, I've got two more years in my appointment. I'm a, you know, six-year term appointment. And then I discovered if I wanted to, I can get reappointed for another six years beyond that as well. It's written uh, in the Farm Bill. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's been an incredible uh, opportunity for me. Again, you know, going back to where I come from, the, the circumstances that I grew up in in India and then coming here and being able to, in quotes, uh, pay forward uh, to America that fed me, educated me and all that too. Uh, so, you know, really, if, if you look at it, you know, the, the mission area that I work in, the research, education, economics mission area, uh, Kathy Wateki, the, the leadership that she has brought uh, to bear, a very thoughtful uh, leadership that she has brought to bear. And, uh, and not that I, she and I have not had uh, uh, interesting conversations. It's not like I just, you know, keel over and say, oh, okay, you know, yes, ma'am. No, I've never been, I've been, always been taught to question authority. And I think it's my mother that, uh, she, she's one of my heroes, my mother is. And, and she taught me never, you know, accept anything and everything that people tell you. And, and you always got to question that. But she has brought that, that style of leadership. And I think, you know, Secretary Tom Vilsack is a passionate uh, proponent of this, of, in general, food and agriculture. But he is, he loves research. Every other day, once or twice a week, maybe once a week or every other week or whatever, I'll send him a little story about some incredible discovery or invention that's been made. The most recent one that I sent him is work being done at Iowa State University. They've taken what's called as graphene, which is basically a whole bunch of carbons, it's like soot, strung together in the form of a sheet. You can imagine that, a very, very thin, very light sheet. Very light. It's even thinner than paper. And on it, funding that we provided, NEFA provided, they figured out how to stick to that graphene sheet circuits, electronic circuits. So now imagine, and this is derived from plant material. Now imagine you can make wearable, now we talk about wearable technologies, MIT, the Media Lab's doing all these things as well. Imagine this very lightweight. I mean, imagine this iPhone that's so small already, or my Apple Watch that's so small already, could be even lighter and smaller because of graphene and the electronics that you can put based on the results of the work that we funded. So I sent a note to Secretary Vilsack. He's like a kid in a toy store. He loves it. He eats it up. And he wanted more information about this. And uh, every time I sent him a note, he wants to be briefed on it. He wants to know more about it. And, and I think, you know, in his heart of hearts, yeah, he's an attorney, he's a small town mayor, et cetera, that he likes to talk about. Uh, but in his heart of hearts, I think he's a scientist as well. Because it's the curiosity, it's, it's that you know, drive to, to understand the nature of things and use that knowledge to help make things better for people around you. And, and so, you know, who'd have thunk it? I never thought I was gonna be sitting here, uh, here talking to you. And, and being within the Department of Agriculture. And this is a historic administration as well. President Obama, you know, as an African-American, uh, to be the president and uh, uh, for me to have been offered the opportunity to be the, the director of NIFA. Oh man, talk about being stoked. This is, you can't beat this. So it's been fantastic. Well, good. Well, thank you very much. All right, thanks a bunch. Mm -hmm. Susan, appreciate it.